Boy, apartment living. Right, except if you're the maintenance uh, man at that <laughs> apartment. So but yeah. They tell you to be sure to um, work, um, warm up before you go out as if you were going to exercise. Forget it, then I'm never gonna show up. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let it be the poor man's stress test. <laughs> right, right. All right, without further ado, good morning to everybody. And we are at uh, the second chapter of Pirkei Avot, fundamental teachings uh, of our tradition about uh, right ways of living. We are our second chapter and we're at the second Mishnah. Okay, so, um, and hold on a second, here we go. Um, and if uh, uh, someone would be so good as to read, as usual, we have, um, but we at the moment, uh, I don't see Josie, right? Josie's not here yet? Not yet. Not yet, and uh, we'll see. Um, maybe what we'll try to do is after we read the uh, more uh, uh, usual, uh, uh, translation that's more widespread. Maybe somebody will try to channel Rabbi Shapiro and see uh, how uh, you know we've 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 studied his teachings already. We we're getting a little bit of a of a grip on what his style is, right? Um, okay. Anyway, Mishnah two. Who would like to read for us, please? Okay, Geraldine, go. Rabbi Gamaliel, son of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, taught. The study of Torah is commendable when combined with a gainful occupation, for when a person toils in both, sin is driven out of mind. Study alone without an occupation leads to idleness and ultimately to sin. All who serve in behalf of the community should do so for heaven's sake. Their work will prosper because the inherited merit of our ancestors endures forever. God will abundantly reward them as though they had achieved it all through their own efforts. Okay, thank you. So um, as you can see, uh, this is a nice, thick, full uh, paragraph. Um, and it's got a lot of um, uh, teachings. Uh, basically, it still has sort of um, three uh, basic teachings and then a little coda at the end. Um, he teaches, 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 and then at the end, uh, God comes out and speaks. But uh, um, who is this person? This is Rabban Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. So Rabban Gamliel is um, a second Rabban Gamliel. I mentioned that uh, before. Um, and the first Rabban Gamliel is called Rabban, Rabban Gamliel, the, end, the elder or the great. And this is another, uh, like in many dynastic kinds of families, the names keep on recurring over the generations. They use them again and again and again. So Gamliel is uh, the name that was a family favorite. And here he is the son of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Yehuda the prince, Rabbi Yehuda the patriarch. Um, which gives us a timing that places this Mishnah at the end of the Mishnaic period. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was, is, and was credited with publishing, putting together in its final form, the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the first uh, official uh, compendium of rabbinic Judaism, of rabbinic teaching. And it includes the six orders of the Mishnah, and all the tractates that we learn when we study uh, Talmud are interpretations of those Mishnah teachings. And the Mishnah covers all the different areas of Jewish life, uh, prayer and agriculture and purity and impurity and civil law, all kinds of stuff, temple law. So the Mishnah tries to give a complete over, whole overview and, and uh, um, a statement about how the rabbis uh, try to deal with uh, the Torah. So it is the next great work after the Tanakh in our uh, canon, right? Um, so Rabbi Yehuda Nasi 
is the editor, the one who, who under his auspices, it doesn't mean that he single-handedly did it, but he had help and he had the power uh, as the leader of the Jewish community authorized by the Roman authorities to take care of everything in, in, uh, in uh, the land of Israel, the Jewish community there. Um, he had the power to organize the project, to come uh, to make the, power, the project come to fruition. Um, he was a great scholar in his own right, which helped. Um, and uh, we had him uh, as a teacher in the previous Mishnah, Mishnah 1. So now his son is credited with teachings. And this means that we are, that we are moving theoretically past the moment when the Mishnah is edited. So this is, hey, Josie, you came in just in time. We're going to need your translation of Mishnah 2, chapter 2 in a second. Get it ready, please. So uh, um, we are coming to the, to, the, to the very edge of the end of the Mishnahic period. And uh, he is giving credit here with these teachings. Uh, so uh, we understand that Pirkei Avot is actually pretty much the last Mishnahic book, tractate as we call it, you know, fancy word. Um, that was compiled to put into uh, the Mishnah. And it's this kind of like, again, it's this consummation. Okay, we're not gonna talk about a lot of legal stuff. We're gonna talk about some wisdom. We're gonna talk about how to approach everything that we do and how to evaluate it and how to think about it. So Rabbi Gamliel, uh, the next generation um, is, is, is uh, speaking. His name, Rabban, his title Rabban means our rabbi, right? So not just any rabbi, his father is called rabbi, just rabbi, because he's the rabbi, the rabbi's rabbi. But rabban was the title of the patriarchs, our master, right? The word rav means master. Um, so our master, Gamliel, uh, the son of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Okay, good. So Josie, you didn't hear the, uh, the translation that we just read, uh, that Geraldine read, but we need you to, uh, you took everybody off the hook. I was gonna ask people to see if they could imagine what uh, uh, Rabbi Shapiro's translation might be. Does anybody wanna try it anyway? No takers, unbelievable, I can't believe it. All right. Well, somehow or other Rabbi Shapiro had the audacity to try to channel himself. So let's see what he said. You have to unmute. That's going to be like the Zoom per vote. The first one, Rabban Gamliel said, in order to speak, you must unmute yourself. <laughs> this two, verse two, right? Rabban Gamliel. Mishnah two. It's called Mishnah two. It's not a verse. It's not scripture, but it's a Mishnah. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi teaches. No, Rabban oh. Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yehuda. Yeah, Rab Rabban Gamil ben Rabbi Yehuda Hanisi teaches, engrossed in learning, engaged in work, you forget the pangs of selfish desire. Learning without labor is barren and robs the world of your effort. Do not profit from community service. If you promote the welfare of all, you tap the merit of the community. Your efforts will endure and God will credit you as if you had acted alone. That's a lot. Yeah. All right, that's a mouthful, yes. Okay, so good. And, and a lot of people are thinking, yeah, that's exactly what, how I would have phrased it. Um, right, good. Okay, so um, let's start unpacking. What, what's going on? The first, the first of, the, of these uh, uh, phrases, the first of these teachings. In Hebrew, it's Yafeh Talmud Torah Im Derech Eretz. Okay, so the translation that we had before, Geraldine, you had, what did you have for um, how worthy or good is, is the study of Torah together with? When a person toils in both. In both sin, what? The study of Torah is commendable when combined with a gainful occupation. A gainful occupation. My translation is worldly occupation. 
um, something like that. Okay, so, and because when you do both of them, then what happens? Mm -hmm. For when a person toils in both, sin is driven out of mind. Okay. And, uh, um, and so in the Hebrew is she giachnehem, which means working hard on both of them, right? Mashkachat avon, makes sin be forgotten, right? Lishkoach uh, is to forget. So um, the first word is yafe, yafe, very nice, right? Very nice. So we have here a translation of commendable, my translation is excellent is the study of Torah. Um, um, Yafe is like, this is the appropriate way, right? This is, this is, the, this is when it all fits together, fits mm -hmm. together well. So the study of Torah, Talmud Torah, im derech eretz. So derech eretz is a term that we may have heard many times or a few times, a little derech eretz. Um, in um, modern usage coming out of uh, Yiddish uh, uh, popular usage, Derech Eretz usually means uh, manners, a certain sense of uh, respect for, for your elders, uh, for your parents. Um, Derech Eretz means the way of the land. That's the literal translation, the way of the land. So, um, it became uh, understood as this kind of like, have consideration, have a sense of propriety and, uh, and respect. But that's not usually what it means, almost never in fact, in rabbinic literature. In rabbinic literature, um, it mostly means what we have here. Derech Eretz means the way of the earth that is that we have to work. What did God say at the very beginning when God, uh, uh, you know, confronts Adam and Eve, it says, uh, um, you know, this land, this earth that you live on is cursed now. And instead of having it easy in the Garden of Eden, you're going to have to work for a living. You're going to have to sweat to be able to uh, eat some bread. And so, shovel your own snow. Yep. Yeah. Well, although, although that, well, if we got the reward of the bread right after the shoveling, it wouldn't be so bad. So um, yeah, so so a lot of hard work, a lot of a lot of hard work is involved. So that's the, the meaning of derech eretz. Um, I don't want to get uh, uh, people too uh, um, diverted, but another meaning of derech eretz in rabbinic literature is um, doing what comes naturally. Mm. So uh, it sometimes means the the uh, the way of the birds and the bees. So, uh, um, because that's what makes the world go round. So that's another meaning, and you have to, uh, um, uh, you know, see where it's used there in that kind of euphemistic way. Um, here it's uh, um, clear that Rabbi Gamliel is saying you need to do both uh, study Torah and work for a living. Do um, do some kind of uh, uh, um, trade, profession, or something. And why is that so great? Because if you work so hard with both of those things, sin will be forgotten. It will make sin fly out of your mind. Rabbi, is, is, is that why it's sometimes startling to hear about some great sage who worked as a peddler or a carpenter or a stonemason, you know, that even the famous rabbis had to have a day job. Right. Certainly in rabbinic times, that was mostly the case. Um, you had certain people, and here's the irony, Rabban Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, did not have a day job. Ah, he was Rabbi, just... Rabban Gamliel was, a, was aristocracy. Ah. He was Jewish nobility. He had a whole estate and he had the uh, land holdings that he uh, inherited from his father. This was, you know, literally, these were the people who descended from King David's household and they were uh, supported by, um, by the Jewish community that was invested in having 
Jewish leadership, not just the Roman leadership. They wanted to have people that they could be proud of, that they could look up to, who, who had all the trappings of, uh, of power and prestige and status. So uh, um, that's why sometimes the translation in, in, uh, in the English is Judah the prince. It was a princely family. So Rabban Gamliel himself doesn't have to go out and mend uh, shoes or do all that kind of stuff. Although on the other hand, it's not as if he's uh, also twiddling his thumbs. He was involved just as his father and his grandfather and his great grandfather in all of the administrative, political, social questions of what it meant to be a, a, a community under the thumb of a great empire that was striving to have its own unique way of life and you know, survive and thrive. So he had a lot of headaches. He had a lot of, uh, you know, he was, he was the president. Right. So, no, he's not he's not going out there and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, harvesting uh, grapes, but uh, he's got a full time job. Yeah, John. So I have a question about the word combined, because there's sort of two ways to look at it. You could say it's good to study Torah and it's good to have a worldly job because it keeps you busy. But combined also to me more implied that you need to mix the study of Torah with your actual job, that somehow you're cross-pollinating the two things together. So, so, so um, my question is what, what word is used in Hebrew and what way should that word be? The word is with. It's, it's good when Talmud Torah is with um, um, Derech Eretz, with worldly work. Um, and it brings up, that's where combined with, mixed with, uh, engaged with, all you have is the width, and that opens up, you know, your your uh, comment, and it opens up the territory for just asking in general. Is that when Ram Gamliel says this is the this is why it's so good? Is that the only reason we can think of for why it might be good to do those two things together? Your you know your explanation is on a much loftier place than his, right? He his he's talking as a preventative measure. Right, just like his father before him said, "Look at three things, and you and you won't come to sin." Right, that was the end of of uh, the previous Mishnah. Right, remember, God is watching. God is watching. Um, but uh, um, the preoccupation with avoiding sin is continuing here, and here we have a positive, active way to do it. Don't worry about contemplating God. Uh, you know, uh, uh, watching you every second. Just keep yourself busy. Busy. Keep yourself. Busy. <laughs> is that so? Is, it's a little bit of a of a kind of a you know not not the, not the most inspiring teaching, is it? Um, what what? Uh, then we have the next one, right? Let's even go to the next one. The next one is also about sin. Then we can come back again, right? And all Torah, the word Torah is in the Hebrew. That doesn't that doesn't have with it. That's that same word, word im ima with her, uh, melacha, labor, sofa betela. In the end, it is it comes to nothing, or it is canceled. Vigoreret avon, and it drags along with it sin. There's that word again, sin. So. Um, He's certainly focusing on a particular kind of uh, concern, and uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, cover all the all the bases that we might be thinking about. Sarita, yeah, and then uh, Danielle. Hey, okay. sorry, I, my mom has a comment of your thing you're teaching. She kind of like gave me. She's the one come on camera, so she like gave me like the note. Uh, just okay, so, uh, I'm going to ask you just one second. Be patient, please. Oh, let Sarita speak, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. That was a, that's okay. Um, okay, so I'm just, um, I'm thinking that um, obviously what kind of sin here, um, and you know, if you, if you just study Torah and you're immersed in it, um, there's the propensity then to sort of think that you are, I'm so knowledgeable, I'm better than everybody else. Um, so that's one thing, you know, to sort of almost take um, excessive pride um, and such, and and the other thing is it can divorce you from, you know, your the, their feelings and your connection with the rest of the world, 
Um, and so that also, I mean, both of those. And, and I, I can't help in that vein of thinking about um, the Haredi who seem to value, you know, um, Haredi, a culture, right. the, huh? Haredi. Haredi. Haredi, yes. Who, Ultra there's a Orthodox. culture of just immersing yourself in Torah study and not, right? Um, that, that just just doing that is, you know, um, what, what your life should be, you know, and perhaps being supported by others and not engaging. And in fact, what happens is this, the sense that we're better Jews than everybody else and um, um, a disconnection from caring about the rest of the world, even other people um, who, are, who are Jewish, who are not members of your immediate community. Um, so I, I'm just, that all of that is milling through my mind as I read this. Okay, thank you. Yes, back to you, Danielle. Yes, or, or your mom, Olga, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, let me just try to put this on the big screen. All right, well, mom's comment says, Abraham offered sacrifice that fell on the generations as a blessing and covered many like Jacob. His prayers and sacrifice were rewarded to future generations. I don't know your input on that, but that's her comment. Right. So I think what your what your mom is is referring to is the last part of this Mishnah, when we talk about the merit of our ancestors, that we depend on the merit of our ancestors, and our ancestors, of course, include Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. So let's hold off on that comment. What does that mean, merit of our ancestors? Well, that's an important point, but we're not up to that yet because we're going slow. We're just taking the first couple of pieces uh, of the uh, of the Mishnah first. Yeah, Carney. Picking up on what uh, Sarita said, I, you'll correct me if I've got this wrong, but I seem to recall one of the walking stories of the Zohar in which the two rabbis encounter this ordinary guy on the road, begin talking with him and discover that he's fa fabulously learned and wise and ask him why he isn't devoted his life to Torah. And he basically says, hey, I've got to make a living. I got kids to put through college or words to that effect. Right. Actually, kids to put through yeshiva so that they can study Torah. So, so, so uh, I've got it. Yes, that's right. That's that. That was an episode in the Zohar. Yeah, John. Is this also a, a, a little bit just like uh, "Don't talk from your ivory tower" sort of um, point of view? I mean, the, the this week, a group of uh, an organization of theater people from universities sort of pu published this symposium of how we in the profession should conduct ourselves and make money and whatever. And, and people are sort of going crazy saying, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have guaranteed jobs for life. Don't talk to us about freelance work. So I wonder if it's a little bit that, don't speak from your ivory tower right. because who's gonna listen, right? Or, well, you're saying who's gonna listen. And what Sarita was saying is watch out what you're gonna say when you only think from your ivory tower. You'll come out saying all kinds of things that are questionable at best. <clears throat> yeah, Craig. Yeah, I was just wondering if this isn't some uh, also a polemic against the monastic life. Um, I don't know what was going on culturally at that time. Um, you know, certainly we know that Christianity later on, you know, you had monks, you know, who seclude themselves and, uh, you know, in monasteries. And this is saying, no, that is not the proper way to go. Right. I think, I think that that's just, just, just beginning at this point. I think it, uh, Christianity itself is in its infancy. Um, you know, so we're talking approximately... 250 CE. I don't think actually the the uh, the monk uh, traditions have, have, have been established yet in any kind of serious way. Um, every religious tradition knows about hermits and uh, you know the people that are just you know you know holy people that are only involved in their own little dreams and and whatever. Um, so I don't know if it, that's uh, um, precisely the target that, that Ram Gamliel has. Um, but the priestly class in, in the Jewish community was a, a class that, that by Torah's mandate was supposed to be supported by everybody else and didn't, uh, you know, didn't supposedly uh, uh, have that much uh, you know, uh, agricultural uh, uh, land to, to work on and, and so on. Uh, they were supposed to stay holy. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's not so clear who, uh, sociologically, who he might be talking to. I want to I come back to the text itself, though, 
And again, if we take the first step and the second step together, the first step says it's really nice or it's really, really, really nice to combine Torah learning with uh, a worldly occupation, right? And that, cause it's good, it, it'll, it'll, it'll drive away sin. And we can think about it as it'll drive away sin. You yourself personally will just won't have a lot of free time to go off and, and, and do terrible things. Or your thinking will be uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, conditioned much better so that you won't sin in what you tell people about what's important because you'll have a broader perspective and a more, and a more you know, earthy grounding to your, to your teaching. But then the second one is any Torah that doesn't have work with it is comes to nothing and brings about sin. That's a lot more militant than the first statement, right? If you have the second statement, you are not going to you, forget the first statement. You know, we can we can put the first statement, you know, back in the drawer. Um, that's a very nice diplomatic way of of talking to people. You know, it would be really nice if you actually got out there a little bit more and 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 learned a little bit about the realities of life. The second one is. I'm telling you right now, if you don't do this, everything that you're that you're that you're working on as as a Torah scholar is going to be, you know, nothing, and worse, right? It's a much stronger uh, statement. So, um, what do we do with that? How do we how do we uh, you know uh, look at those two together? Yeah, Audrey. Well, one thought that comes to mind is when we see religion. Uh, any religion, our religion as well, um, be misused. And, and perhaps this statement understands that people, if they're just too involved in thinking and studying and being isolated by spiritual pursuits without being grounded to life and to other people, you can really go off track and misuse the religion. Yeah, that's so, my that's my take on that. that. Yeah, I think he's very concerned with that. Um, and uh, I'm just thinking in terms of how do we place what's the relationship between those two sayings? Um, I think that maybe we have, you know, a progression. Maybe once upon a time, Ram Gamliel was a lot gentler in his way of trying to get people to uh, um, combine Torah with with uh, with Derech Eretz. And then the second teaching, I don't know that it comes coherently one from the other. It could be actually a, a different time of his career where he gets a little impatient. And he says, you know what? You're not listening. The stakes are very high here. It's not just that if you don't do this, then sin lurks at the door. You're gonna actively bring sin to happen. Right, it's a, it's a much much uh, uh, you know bigger kind of, of warning, Adam. Yeah, um, <clears throat> sort of going off what you were saying, I'm wondering why in that second part it doesn't say Talmud Torah, it just says the whole Torah, um, because it seems in in the English anyway, it, it's like a parallel structure, but it, I don't, I'm not sure the Hebrew reads that way. Right, so I think that that. I would, and then we're going to stop. I think that Talmud Torah means the activity of studying Torah. Mm. What is produced? What is manufactured by such activity? The answer is Torah. So when we study Torah, we, we speak words of Torah, we create more Torah. His second statement then could be understood as the product of your work, you're gonna spend 20 hours a day studying Torah. You know, there are, there are stories of these great Torah, you know, uh, devotees, they never sleep. Uh, they, they uh, you know, ascetically, you know, torture themselves to keep on going. He says, you're gonna work so hard and you're gonna to create Torah. You're going to, the Torah now literally means your teaching. The teaching that you come up with is going to be infected by this missing, by missing out on this important ingredient. 
if you don't have that labor, if this goes back to John's original point, if you don't have that labor as something that has suffused your teaching, then it's going to come to nothing. Not only that, it will lead to sin. The opposite of what you think your teaching is supposed to be about, right? Everybody is supposed to be teaching Torah to keep people pious and to keep people serving God and to keep people righteous and to improve the world. Guess what? Your Torah will do the exact opposite. So a cautionary uh, uh, statement. All right, we'll continue with this next time and hopefully get to the merit of our ancestors in our next session. Okay. Be well to everybody. Sure.